Today's episode of The Beauty Of with me, David Lopez, is up now. And I was joined by AM Dark, the the most <laughs> like radically beautiful person I've ever met who just opened my mind. I know it'll open your mind as well. Uh, really gave us so much beautiful information. Look at this stunning. Wait, I can. Stunning. You have to give us a whole moment of this look. Oh, <laughs> obsessed. Hi friends, welcome to The Beauty Of, an ulti beauty podcast where we talk to and learn from the pioneers that are helping us redefine what beauty is and where it lives. I am David Lopez. I've had many titles, been called many things, celebrity <laughs> hairstylist, beauty content creator, Aquarius. Uh, oh no. I know, I know. <laughs> Leo Rising gets even better. Mm. Uh, but today I am your host. Host And before we get started, I just want to remind you that this is a safe space. It's a judgment-free zone where we honor curiosity and respect. Um, today's guest, uh, I'm very excited to talk to and learn from as we were just chatting, uh, a newly tenured professor um, at UC Santa Cruz. Please welcome A.M. Dark. Hey. Hi. <laughs> For those of you watching, I mean, let's take a look at this cape moment. Uh, I love a cape, my own brujeria moment. I'm obsessed with it. We kind of similar color moments. Um, okay, so how would you summarize what it is that you teach and how it impacts us on an everyday level? Oh my gosh. I know that's that's a I lot. Know, right? No, I used to have little 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 clips for this and I'm yeah. trying to draw from them. Um so two parts of this. One, I usually work with large scale social issues, right? Issues uh, around race, gender, standards of beauty, um, things that, uh, you know, make our society operate for better or for worse. And um, I take those large scale systemic issues and I try to distill them down into a more intimate, playful space to open it up for people to really have critical reflections and discussions um, about things that can be overwhelming or that can feel very academic or removed from a more everyday personal space. Um, I often make games. I also make, um, sometimes I do performance art, video art, glitch art, but everything that I do is really about the body and identity and power and depression. So when it comes to, I guess now we're going into, in the gaming community, people create characters on themselves. And we used to say it was, oh, it's anonymous, but as we're learning, it's not anonymous. Mm -hmm. It's a very much, very direct reflection of people's real thoughts and emotions mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and now actions as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about the open source Afro hair library, can you tell us more about it and why you were inspired to start that project? Yeah, so um, the Open Source Afro Hair Library is a queer, feminist, pro-black database of 3D models of um, black hair textures and styles. And I started this project because um, I, so as a media artist, I work in a lot of different um, forms and I was making VR work, um, virtual reality work. So basically using like a game engine to play out an art piece, but I'm not a 3D modeler. So I was kind of using the equivalent of a character creator. Like I had 20 different people I needed to re represent. And I'm like, well, I guess I turn this dial and that they look more black or they turn this dial and then they look like a different person. Um, and it was going really well in terms of everyone felt very unique. Um, and I was using real people's stories or these audio recordings or kind of uh, personal testimonials about what it's like to navigate public space in the body that you have. Mm. So I needed a kind of realness in the avatars. They had to represent that um, physicality. Um, I stumbled in that work because when it got to the hair in the tools I was using, there's only one Afro hair texture. And it was one of the three we usually get, which is, the, in this case, it was the unstyled dreads. It was just like, we got locks, but there's no parting. There's no, they're just not like moisturized. Kinda off they're just kind of here, yeah. you know? Um, so I was like, okay, great. And I'm like, I can't just give all the black characters locks. That doesn't make sense. So, um, you know, you do what you do. I was going to these 3D marketplaces, just looking, okay, maybe I can buy something or download something for free. And I searched for black hair because that's how I referred to my hair, black hair. And what I got were, were pictures of animals, rats, fur, um, or like anime girls with black hair. And I was like, oh, right. To people who aren't black, I guess it's black hair is, is the color. So... I had to go, well, how can I be legible? How does someone see me? And then how do I, I figure that the secret, the secret puzzle so that I can find myself. 
Um, I tried a bunch of things, and I remember feeling this moment, this aha moment of brilliance. You know, I was like, oh, I know. Because curly wasn't working, kinky wasn't working, none of that was working. Oh, so you tried other words. I tried other words. Working. I tried other words. Did you try, like, white hair and see what came up? Or, like, blonde hair? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. I love that. Did you try, like, the flip? Girl, I'm not that smart. See, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I needed to, I needed to, you would have been there. This is what I say. It's, like, so silly. Right, right. Because I was like, let me tell you, when I got it, when I got the key, I was like, Afro hair. I was like, this is perfect. Afro is a hairstyle. Yeah. It's but this is gonna get the results. And then the results, I mean, I got more black people, but it was bad. It was like so it's like I did not need to see how other people saw me in that way. Oh, okay. It was minstrels and mammies. It was just so dehumanizing and just plain ugly, quite frankly. Um and and Characters that didn't seem black at all. I was so there's a character called Mixed Race Jerry, and as a <laughs> listen, as a light skinned person, I often do not. I'm like I don't have light skinned tears. I have a lot of privilege, but I was like, damn, this is what I look like mm. because it was this modeled, like not even human kind of skin. This nose, these eyes. That I mean, it was monstrous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the bad results. But but there were other layers to this, like seeing in a grid, in a marketplace, black bodies being bought and sold. Virtual black bodies, but still. Seeing packs of black feet that you could buy, black hands. And so I recognized that this wasn't just a representation issue that we always talk about. Well, we just need more representation. I was like, I don't wanna just have there be more black models in this marketplace space. I actually think we need to shift the context from commodifying black bodies Again, the virtual and the corporeal, not that different. It does reinforce certain mm -hmm. thoughts and behaviors. Mm -hmm. And what does it look like to create blackness or envision blackness that's envisioned by black people hmm. and to not sell it? What does it mean to, instead of creating a utility, create a community? What is it like to have a resource that serves everyone and doesn't have this sense of ownership? And this is also why I thought of libraries. I'm like, I love libraries. They're an incredible institution that really adapts to their community. Mm -hmm. Whether you are a multi-degreed scholar or you're an unhoused neighbor, like that's what community, like libraries are sites of community in that way. And so I wanted to develop something that, yeah, we look fly and you can download this and put in your video game, but also you're not just going to extract blackness. You're going to navigate the space by learning terms. There's no search bar. You have to click on tags that are like kinky, type four, twist out. So you're gonna learn, if you didn't know, you're gonna learn what black hair is about. You're gonna learn the vernacular. You're gonna learn the oh. culture just by engaging with it. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is the library is um, created uh, through a fellowship program that I started where I work with black 3D artists and each one comes up with a series. And beauty is an important part of this because I kind of am borrowing from fashion. I say, you name the series, you come up with a theme. It's not just random. We're showing the vision of blackness, the cohesive vision of blackness. You know, I want it to be like you opened like a, an incredible fashion spread when you land on this site. You've forgotten mm. why you're here. You're just like stunned by the beauty because beauty has power. Beauty is important. Beauty can transform us. So, you know, the, that's a lot of those thoughts have gone into the manifestation of this project. We've we've talked about um, a little bit the power of beauty and in your own experience um, through your experience in life and how you move out to certain spaces, the power you found in presenting beauty mm -hmm. and the power it has. What was that journey like for you? Have you always felt beautiful? Do you feel that you have redefined what beautiful, I, I can say this for myself to give you context. Mm -hmm. Like I had an idea of what beautiful felt like and what it was. And as I've explored myself and through therapy and through um, community, I have reimagined, I straightened my hair for over a decade. Same. <laughs> you know? Oh my God. I same. never, ever would have gone, ever, mm -hmm. ever. I would have, I literally cannot believe the mental gymnastics I did to tell myself that this hair mm -hmm. was not viable, not sexually viable, not mm -hmm. romantically viable, and no mm -hmm. one would want to touch it or see me as attractive. I was in instantly, mm -hmm. instantly from the time I'm born, inferior to someone mm -hmm. with straight hair. And unprofessional, unpolished, yeah. un unready, mm -hmm. unkempt. Yeah. Yeah. So how was that journey like for you? Because we're talking about the Afro Hair Library <laughs> and you know there is like legislation that is like trying to be passed, that is being passed about 
it being legal to fire someone for their hairstyle. The Crown Act, which Crown I think Act. we just have in California, but is not mm-hmm. a national mm-hmm. um, uh, law. <sighs> Thank you so much for sharing that because it's been a journey. And sometimes I forget that I did not know what my own natural texture was until I was about 11. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, why is my hair stringy on the ends? But then what are these little spirals? Those seem cute. What's going on there? And it's like, oh, you know that thing that we do every month? That cream, that burning stuff that we put on your head, little child? That's called a relaxer. And I remember the moment I started doing my own hair was because I was like, oh, no, we're cutting that off. And even then, I still straightened my hair. You know, I when you ask what I thought beauty was back then, I thought beauty was thinness, Mm. whiteness, being as close to the sort of blonde cheerleader as I possibly could. And I knew there were certain things, limitations, little melanated limitations. (laughs) Imagine melanin as a limitation, right? Kink as a limitation, as opposed to the fun thing it is now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, you know, it's like I was trying to fit that mode. And the reason why wasn't because I had an internalized sense of it being beautiful, I think even as a kid, I kind of, I really hated being a girl. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm AFAB, you know. And so I think, I'm oh, sorry, I'm like, AFAB, wait, A-fab, assigned female birth. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I remember being told, you can't play football. You have to play this because you're a girl. You have to wear earrings all the time because that's feminine. And I really hated the rules of girlness. So I never really looked at beauty in that way, like I had to do this. But what I saw is that people who fit what I was told was beautiful, especially what I was told was feminine and beautiful, that they seemed happier, that they seemed to be treated better. And that's what I wanted. So I was like, okay, what is the rule? What are the check boxes that I need so that I can be human Mm, too? That's what you're looking for. You're looking Mm -hmm. for... It's an... (laughs) If you have not experienced it, and and even if you're listening to this and you're black, brown, and you you, I have never really thought about this. What I was looking for was where can I express privilege? Where can I cosplay mm-hmm. as best possible? Where can I align myself with what is beautiful as close as possible I can get to it? You know, how close to the sun can I get? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Being from the Caribbean, I mean. It's multiracial, and I mean, I didn't even realize, honestly, until the Black Lives Matter movement that I had spent my whole life aligning myself with whiteness. I wasn't like, oh, then my hair's softer and prettier. I was like, oh, no, like the way that you choose to speak, that you chose to dress yourself, the way you chose to present Mm -hmm, these mm -hmm. things. I was told from the time, like, oh, you're being too loud. It's being Puerto Rican. I mean, it's like all like Mm -hmm, the stereotypes mm -hmm, being Puerto Rican, mm -hmm, being from the Caribbean. It's like... If I am any of those things, I will not be taken seriously. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I will not be heard. I will not be seen as valuable. Mm-hmm. I have to not be any of those things. But mm-hmm. I can still be, now I know, I can be all of these things and still have value. So I've never really... That's that aspirational whiteness. <laughs> but here's the thing. I want to reframe it a little bit, what you're saying, because it's all true and it all resonates so deeply with me. But that idea that you were trying to access some of the privilege. Mm. You know, those of us who've been thinking about these things and feeling those things, that can also feel bad. Like you can sometimes shame yourself like, oh, well, I did that because I was trying to be Mm. privileged and being privileged is bad. No, you are trying to find safety. Mm. We are trying to find safety. And so that sense of security, that sense of I can just move through the world and I don't have to look over my shoulder. No one is making moral judgments about who I am. They're not telling me I'm less than because it's not just like, well, we're so sensitive and someone said we're less than. And it's okay if that's if that's what's going on. But I really think that's something deeper. It's that we see how folks like we're both light skinned folks with looser textured hair. We see what happens to folks who are whiter than us and we see what happens to folks who are blacker than us. We see what happens to folks who present their neurodivergence maybe more than we do. We see what happens to folks who are not. And I think we are clamoring for, oh my God, I don't. I'm already suffering maybe. I'm already mm-hmm. dealing with this. I don't. I can't take anymore. What can I do to, to protect myself and shore up the, the little bits that I have, the yeah. little bits of safety that I have? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the thing that I keep coming back to is that people like us, like there's especially now having these more intimate conversations, so many similarities between us. And um, beauty for me, um, 
and my ritual and the way that I express beauty has in so many ways, I can say, saved my life um, in, in something that other people have looked at and said to me, it's shallow. I mean, someone even as recently said, how much time do you spend in front of a mirror? And I remember thinking like, if you only knew how looking in front of a mirror saved my life, how touching my skin, touching my hair, mm -hmm. having that intimate relationship with myself in a mirror has mm -hmm. quite literally saved mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. How routines, self-care, product, a moisturizer, these things that have helped me so much express myself and be okay in my skin as tools to be comfortable in my skin. Not that you need them mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, be comfortable mm -hmm. in your skin, but how they have helped me personally. I see so many similarities in there and also something that we brought up before we were, we were talking before we came in here, I had never thought about, um, and I talk about this often, my introversion, and we talked about this in one of the episodes, that the exhaustion I feel especially my therapist and I talk about this a lot, mm -hmm. the exhaustion is because I'm performing all the time. Yes. I'm even God. performing my anxiety sometimes. I'm performing my, you know, it's like mm -hmm. I, I'm afraid to show the chaos of mm -hmm. what it is to be neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. I still have to present it like in a package for someone in a way that's like, I'm having an off day. It's like, you don't even know what's happening mm -hmm. internally mm -hmm. when I close that door, the mm -hmm. spirals that I go through mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how I mm -hmm. consistently have turned to my rituals and my routines and beauty as a mm -hmm. form of slight disassociation, mm -hmm. but also like in my femme mode with my lashes and my hair and everything, mm -hmm. the power that I feel in that beauty is like anything else that I've ever felt. Oh my gosh. L we were talking about that. We had just started talking about this. And I'm like, let me tell you about beauty. Because we were talking about, like, <laughs> the idea of people being like, well, you know, um, you have a traditionally beautiful look. And it, it, what it implies is, like, you didn't have to try. Like, you were just born with it, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so you have this pretty privilege. But when people say that beauty is shallow, they're never talking about the people who are born with it. And let's be real. You know, the thin, long, Nordic-looking white woman with the naturally blonde hair, they never look at that person and say, you are shallow because you were born with it. They say that to those of us who are working for the beauty, who are spending our time and energy on it, because it's okay to be beautiful as long as you didn't try. <laughs> And so I literally right, need to write right? that down. Seriously, yeah. when you talk about your rituals, you know what I hear? I hear control. Mm. I hear stability. I hear something that you have power over. Because when you put on your face and you, you know, finger curl your <laughs> hair and you walk in, out into that world, not everyone is looking at you as beautiful. Because mm. they're not even seeing your face. They're seeing some other stuff. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you. But you can weather that and absorb that and, and let that, you know, just fly off you when someone does treat you without dignity or respect or someone does not see you because you know, because you've put on your armor, you've gone through that ritual, you have honored yourself and your ancestors and your own agency by saying, let me do this little brow flick today. Mm -hmm. Let me do it. Let me do the, the liner. And this is what I was talking about before about um, how to me being beautiful in the traditional sense and here i'm saying like feminine beauty yeah mm -hmm. i don't put on my face and do my lashes and all of that so that i can be like well i'm more of a girl mm -hmm. i do it because i'm like when i walk in that room i want it to be like i'm wearing stilettos and you're almost afraid you're like i'm like yeah for me my gender is like i often say you know because I'm, I'm gender chaotic and people are like well what does that mean i was like well it means a lot of things but it's kind of like gender, but I've got a knife. I literally like, relate to that so much. <laughs> right? You don't I literally <laughs> relate to being gender chaotic, full T, full top. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I just think I want people to reflect on that because makeup in particular is a different kind of beauty. Going to the gym is a different kind of beauty. Any of us who had to work on something, maybe we had a cute base. I'm not going to act like I don't have a cute nose. I'm not going to act like that. Okay. I'm not a liar. But... It's not that that is the beauty. That's not the power. It's that I was able to take control of something. So now it doesn't really matter if you thought I looked good or not. I was telling the makeup artist, I was like, I bleached my eyebrows and I did not. I was just so afraid because I was like, I don't think I have the bone structure. And let me really queer. Let me, I said, I think I said queer, but I meant clear, but no, whatever. That's Let me be too. queer. Let me be queer. <laughs> Let me be really queer. Um, 
When I said to myself, I don't have the bone structure for this, what I really meant, honestly, was I am not a skinny person. I don't have the kind of cheekbones and the cut in my face. I have a round face. I'm thick. I'm juicy. I'm chubby. I'm fat, whatever you want to call it. I can't pull this off. I am not going to look like a sexy alien. I might just look toe up. <laughs> I was genuinely worried about that. Right. And my partner finally just said, was like, go bleach them eyebrows. Mm. And then when I did it, I was so happy. Mm. I was like, I can do all kind of crazy graphic eye looks. I'm like, I, I've like transcended the need to be human with the human rules. And I was like, I'm doing all kind of stuff today. And it just, the freedom of that, the, the liberation of that. You cannot tell me beauty is something I'm supposed to be ashamed of or mm. I'm supposed to not put energy into or that mm. it's a waste of time or a superficial. Like, no, that is loving myself. Mm. Fully and mm -hmm. really fully mm -hmm. realized. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite part like of your beauty routine? Are you like a skincare person? It seems like you really enjoy makeup and the transformative aspect mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's your favorite part of like the armor? I... It's not just the armor. There was a time where it was that. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that armor, you know, there's different ways to, to, to wear that and apply that. Mm. I will say my favorite part of doing makeup uh, is definitely eyebrows. I'm a brows person. I love brows. I see people's brows. I'm like, can I do your brows? I just feel like if I could just do a little. <laughs> um, and I think because, you know, eyebrows are so expressive and can so radically change a face. It's like, you know. They really can. Eyebrows can complement a really mean side eye, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they just do so much. And so I think that focus on being able to fully express myself, that focus on really saying, I'm not doing that today. I'm not on that. Whatever y'all mm -hmm. doing, that's fine. I'm on mm -hmm. some other, I'm mm -hmm. on some other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I like... Yeah, I like the exploration. I like the experimentation of makeup. I like that makeup reminds me that all of this is just kind of a transition. Um, especially as I age, I think my make my face changes and my makeup can change. And it doesn't feel like, I think if you're following traditional standards of beauty, it feels like something you're losing, you have to let go. It's like, I'm losing that face, that static face I'm supposed to have. Whereas for me, I'm like, oh, I have new opportunities and new spaces to play. So I am fundamentally a dynamic being. And that, knowing that you don't have to stay someplace, makeup reminds me of that. And that's my favorite part is like, I can always be in flux. I've never heard anyone describe makeup so beautifully, an experience <laughs> of makeup. It really, like you said, people think as you're aging, something's being taken away from you, but you're seeing it as opportunity and still allowing the space for makeup in there, which is mm -hmm. so special. Yeah. Um, I want to go ahead and play a game, a card game. Okay. Um, thank you for that lovely, deep conversation. It's now time to play some card games. I always <laughs> set this up in a similar way because um, this is... A card game, yes, but because I am sorry, I'm like, what you got on that shelf? It's a little bit over there. I know <laughs> it's <crystals>. getting there. <laughs> it's getting there. I'm a little bit of a bruja. I love brujeria. So I'm gonna present three cards. You're gonna pick one. Each of the cards has a question. And you're gonna ask me one and I'm gonna ask you one. So I'm gonna shuffle these up, but I'm presenting it like in a kind of like a tarot way, like past, present, future. I'm getting so you nervous. can like pick <laughs> No, it's okay. Oh my god, the questions aren't like, that deep. <laughs> Some of them are. Some of them are. Okay, so go ahead and pick one of the cards for me. Mm. Okay, I'm drawn to the sun. Too. Okay, amazing. Go ahead and ask me your question. You can go first. Oh, okay. What is the first thing you notice about a person? How they make me feel immediately. I'm a very, very, very deep empath. I, mm. I feel someone's energy more than anything else. Mm. And I'm first impressions for me, bar none, make me feel, is this person safe? or not. And if I don't immediately feel safe around you, I'm going to start performing and acting. And I can't, mm -hmm. and it's, if I don't have the energy for it, mm -hmm. I'm quiet and I disassociate and I, don't even, I can't even talk to you. Oh, that, that introvert, I say introvert, but yeah. I'm like, I'm one of those extroverted introverts. And I've learned, I was like, oh no, that's just called me having low energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if I'm an yeah, introvert, like, that I'm means I haven't tired. eaten. I haven't yeah. like, or I feel like, no, I'll, I'll mess yeah. with that. I have like depleted my energy because there are times I can go into a room full of strangers and I will talk to literally every single person know everyone's mm -hmm. life story. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm, my energy is just depleted. Mm -hmm. um, question for you. What's your favorite hobby to do alone? 
My favorite hobby to do alone. Oh gosh, I hate hobbies. This is me on dating sites. This is me on dating sites. People are like, what's your what hobby? are your favorite hobbies? Riding I'm like, horses. I have dedicated my entire life to making art, which yeah. would be a hobby for most people. So I don't know. Um, That's a hobby. Yeah, but it's like my professional job. Same. So That's it's what like, I, right? when people ask me, I'm like, what's my hobby? I do my hobby for a living. But I okay. Know. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to answer the spirit of the question. I. I like to travel through spaces alone where I'm just observing. So for example, Mm -hmm. just like walking around a neighborhood. And the reason why I say I like doing this alone, like going for walks alone so that I'm not talking, so I don't have to perform, so I don't have to worry about the energy or whatever, the social thing of someone else, but that I get to really like commune with nature. And I say this as a person who lives in Oakland and lives in cities, but I'm like, I kind of love it in cities in particular because you see how much life is there. You see like, oh, like, Okay, look at these birds. What's up? Like you notice, and also I really love the the human details of cities. Something I had been doing, I think I finally stopped collecting junk, but something I used to do, um, if I passed by something that was on the street um, and I found an object, I would pick it up and I would save and I have a whole collection of these. And the objects had to be specific. Just finding junk on the street? No. It would be something. <laughs> like, you have, like, yeah. Secret like, got, <laughs> <laughs> you have, like, It would be like, <laughs> specifically be things that seem like they had recently been dropped. Because I loved the connection of, oh, look at this little doll that was, or this little beanie baby. So maybe somebody was being pushed, you know, somebody's pushing their kid along. So if it's all dirty and raggedy, nah. But yeah. if it's clean, I'm like, misconnection. Like I, I could have seen, if I come by a few minutes earlier, I could have picked this up and had this moment with a person said, hey, oh, hey. So I, I really enjoy, I can't do that with somebody else. You know, people look at me, <laughs> <laughs> look at me crazy. Like, like, girl, put How that many down. like <laughs> missing posts have gone up on like websites where like, I'm missing my doll. Has anyone seen it? And you're like, oh, I found it. I kept it. Sorry. I just have it. a collection. I'm like, yeah, people, oh, I didn't think about that. Maybe people were coming back to get that. You're like, it was <laughs> freshly dropped. I'm like, well, they probably came back for it, but you came too fast. I'm going to start combing all the neighborhood no! websites and we were like I lost my Harry Potter oh, keychain has anyone seen it and you're like it's in my collection they're gonna find the vault of oh mm-hmm. well, I didn't think about it like that I can't so. wait to see that collection <laughs> um, also since we are a newer podcast and in my own home I like to surround myself with very uh, visual reminders of my experiences where I've been um, so I have like little knickknacks everywhere and I wanted to have that here so this shelf has things that guests are coming and leaving that are sentimental or mean something to them to add to the space just so I feel like I have a little bit of their story. Um, So I'm wondering, you brought something and it's here somewhere, I assume, in a a brown box, possibly. I'm like, I did bring something. Oh, you brought these three things here. Did I? <laughs> yes, you did. Okay, yes. Okay, so this, I, we're going to have a moment. Okay, so I love the mutual this. surprise. I'm yeah, like, yeah. You're like, I did. Okay, I'm so. I'm like, I handed some things to some people. I don't know. Okay, so they're all here. Whatever you handed to people, they're here. And I love that this table has now become like a gifting table. Okay. It feels like a new version of the holiday used to be known as Thanksgiving um, with the flowers and this, like a cornucopia of gifts. What do we have here? Okay. Um, I peeked and I'm excited. Uh, okay, so first of all, we have it's still in this plastic. Let me get to you. Let me tell you. Let me Wait, tell let's you. open it. I need to open it. <laughs> I have a. Pe- Who has the nails? Pen. You got. Oh, thank yeah. you. Collaboration. I feel like I can do this. Um, I only ever printed a hundred of those. This is what. Yeah, and I'm giving one to you. Oh my See? god! Because you got it. the right vibes. You got the stop. right vibes. I um. I made that, that was the first game that I ever completed. And I did it uh, in undergrad back in, it's like 10 years old now. Okay. Um, you designed it completely. I designed it completely. And I did drew you, it. You drew I did, it and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell me tell me what this is. So um, it's, uh, it's a party game that you play with friends. And it works very similar to, you know, other games where you're judging, where you like everybody uh, has a deck and or yeah, has something in their hand. And it's like, oh, it's your turn. In this case, you're the judge. So what you're looking for is the most attractive woman. It's a little cis normal, but whatever. Uh, a little, little hetero, but whatever. So everyone is uh, looking through these cards and they're trying to figure out which woman are you going to find the most attractive? And you choose, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Unlike those other games where you're just like, bam, this is my choice. Here, you have to actually justify. So if you're like, I want this woman, for example, I think she's the most attractive. I might hit you with, 
Really? You going for the beatboxing look? Is she a person? Who, what, why she got them cornrows? I don't know. Is that is that a lot of self tanner? I don't know how I feel about that. And then we kind of get to discuss it. Um, or someone else, maybe they played a different card. Maybe they played this one and they're like, yo, she looks like she's in a shampoo commercial. Don't you want? And then we can talk about it. Maybe you're not into that. Right? So um, what it does is it kind of puts each person in the hot spot for a little bit to vocalize and articulate what they find beautiful or attractive. Um, and it'll, basically, it goes back to what I was saying before, where I'm taking something, I'm taking ideas of standards of beauty, colorism, uh, race and gender, uh, and all of the complications of how that informs the politics of desirability mm. and how we kind of assume that all of our desires are personal. People will be like, if I don't like a certain kind of person, who happens to be this skin tone or this, Girl. you know, in the gay you, community, you know, right? Right. I mean, the app profiles would literally say no black, no Mexican, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I mean, just overtly. Mm -hmm. So I get exactly. it. Exactly. When you challenge people about that, they often fall back on the idea of, well, it's just a preference mm -hmm. and preferences are personal. This game isn't trying to tell you who you should be attracted to. It's really pushing back on the idea that preferences are personal. I'm like, no, preferences are internalized from what we've learned about status in our society. And now we're gonna talk about it. Um, let me show you one thing, let me see this deck. I wanna okay. show you something that, um, cause you're looking at this spread of cards and uh, ooh, I gotta, what I'm looking for is um, the game doesn't talk about this in the rules, but every card has a doppelganger. And by that, I mean a character who uh, has the exact same face but a different, just different coloring. So here's an example. Here's a great example. Mm. So what happens is you're making these judgments. So before we didn't have the card and maybe you have these cards out and so it's kind of easier. You're like, oh yeah, I'm just picking a unique person. And if you're listening, mm -hmm. basically it's, it's mm -hmm. two drawn seemingly cis women, mm -hmm. um, people, and but same features, uh, but different color eyes, different color lips, different color skin different color hair, but the shirt is the same colors. Really, I feel like the only thing in the features are the same. So what is this telling us about the two with the doppelgangers? So what happens is when you play this game and you're looking at these different uh, types of women, one strategy people will use so that they, because you play the game, you quickly realize like, you think, oh, it's just a game, what could happen? And with all of my games, I'm kind of a troll. I've lured you in, mm -hmm. it's a game. And now you're like, oh wait, this thing I wanna say, might be problematic. It's giving saw, to be honest, <laughs> right? do you wanna play a game? It's <laughs> literally you, the doll on the bike, holding into the room, do you wanna play a game? Emotionally. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so I've noticed that people would wanna employ these strategies of being like, someone would literally tell me, well, I'm just picking a person who has an asymmetrical haircut. I just love asymmetrical haircuts. I was like, really? You just wanna ignore all the race and gender stuff? Mm. And they were like, yep, show or do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so periodically, you'll have a doppelganger round. You'll have just two folks who are literally the same and all I've done is giving them a, giving them a different paint job. Mm. So now it's like, oh, well they both have asymmetrical haircuts but one has green eyes and one has brown eyes. One has blonde hair, one has brown hair. One seems like a black person and the other one seems like maybe they, they white or ethnically ambiguous, right? So yeah. then you have to confront why you prefer one over the other and really think about that. And the reason I made this as a social game as opposed to like a web experience or something else is that I really wanted to highlight how contextual our attraction is. Like think about when you went to the club, who was hot? Think about when you went to work, who was hot? Think about, right? Like how that shifts based on not just availability, Gee. but who's judging, who mm. you're, who's hot when you're friend, when you're trying to impress your friends mm. versus it's just you. Mm. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I love that. I'm excited to play it. Um, also coming home with me. <laughs> I think I actually we'll this. leave it on the shelf for a little bit. I definitely feel like this is a very interesting conversation start, a great thing to have. Um, and so you don't make them anymore. I am planning to re-release a much more diverse version. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah, this was all cis black women, black, yeah. uh, black <laughs> back when I thought I was a cis black woman. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that's very special. Thank you. Thank you, you for that. Them. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and you have two other things that are wrapped here. I'm curious to know what they are. I love this. I love talking about ritual. I'm like, this is beauty. Right yeah, exactly. Guys. Pulling the string from around the perfectly wrapped paper. Oh, God. I love details. Same. I love the wrapping. Yeah, whoever wrapped this. <laughs> I'm just like, thank you. Thank you. Can't believe I just said that. It looks 
so cute. Okay. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. That's maybe this beautiful. can stay on a shelf somewhere. Yes, that is beautiful. Uh, this is one of the prints um, by an artist named uh, Kanisha Perry, who goes by uh, the handle Timid Clover. Um, she is a black woman 3D artist who was in the first fellowship round for Open Source Afro Hair Library. And um, she did a series called Hey Queen, which was all about the versatility of locks. <laughs> so everything she created, she created nine hairstyles, and they were all locks. And so she was like... I love the way that she described it. She wanted to do uh, virtual hair that was aspirational in its aesthetic, but also was actually practical. Like you could literally style your hair in these ways. So Hey Queen was that like the regality of the everyday. Mm. And so I, I just love the thought that she put into it. It's beautiful. It is so gorgeous. I'm showing it off. If you can't say so you're listening, it's just a beautiful photo. I, I highly encourage you. Can you say the handle? One more time. Uh, timid Clover. Timid Clover, at Timid Clover, just so you can see some of this work. It's it's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. You can also find um, some of these images on um, uh, on Twitter. We have um, Afro Hair Library. Okay. At Afro Hair Library. And you'll see, um, that's usually where I update the work that the artists are doing as we go through the fellowships. So I'm wrapping, unwrapping this uh, kind of... I'm doing oh, yeah. a messy we now. did a clean one and then we <laughs> did know, a messy like, one. But are you still I'm I'm still feeling delicate about it. Yeah. Just like, it's so pretty. Okay. Um so this is um another image from the Open Source Afro Hair Library. Wow. Wow. Right? That is stunning. I love that. Like I, I, I love want those. to see that recreated IRL. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure it already is mm -hmm. existing. This is beautiful. Yeah, so this is um an artist uh named Malika Matumbo. Um, who's working out of uh, Belgium right now. And she is, she's incredible. And one of the things I, I, I loved about her work and why I wanted to share this is because of the focus that she gives, not just on hair, but on makeup. Oh yeah, it's stunning. All of her styles, like when she renders something 3D, she gives everything something kind of glistening, this yeah. dewy look. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like this is what I want to see, like the kind of black virtuality that mirrors our fierceness in the world and even goes beyond. So you'll see her series, um, it's uh, called uh, Transfiction because she creates these um, images of blackness that uh, she's really into fantasy and sometimes like kind of more monstrous work. Mm -hmm. And she takes things that, she creates work that feels traditionally beautiful, but also has that edge I was talking about. Like it feels a little ethereal, a little bit edge. like. Yeah, I wanna, yeah. I wanna show this Dang is it. so beautiful. Can we get a little close up on this little gorgeous? Can you say that art name of the artist one more time? Malika Matumbo. Malika Matumbo in Belgium. You said, mm -hmm. yeah, this is this is absolutely gorgeous. I'm so excited to get this up on the shelf, and then later up in my home. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. You've really shed such beautiful light, and uh, so much of what this podcast is about is opening up the mind and the heart to how we define beauty. And you really did that today. I'm, I'm just so grateful for sharing your space and your intellect and your mind with us. Um, if anyone wants more information about the work that you're doing, where can they find you? You can pretty much find me anywhere at Pretty Dark mm -hmm. with an E at the end. So A-M Dark, D-A-R-K-E. Um, at Pretty Dark, pretty much anywhere. Um, to follow the Afro Hair Library, at Afro Hair Library. Um, there's also afrohairlibrary.org. And if you're interested in looking just at my portfolio and the different kinds of work that I do, then that's at prettydark.cool. Prettydark.cool. Mm -hmm. And there you have it. The newly tenured professor is here. Uh, <laughs> opened up our minds and our hearts a little bit. I hope that you found something or heard something or saw something that uh, kind of helped change your definition of what beauty is and what it can mean to you. Um, up until next time, uh, we are sending you so much love and transferring all this beautiful energy over to you. We'll see you all very soon. Bye-bye.